Welcome panelists, friends, invited guests. Artists Making Art is a roundtable discussion sponsored by the International Focus Organization. For more information about their activities and uh, exhibits and so forth, go to their website, internationalfocus.org, or look them up on Facebook. The mission of the International Focus is to promote mutual understanding between the people of North Carolina's Triangle Region and the international community through education, cultural exchange, arts, and celebration of achievements. Visitors may ask questions in the chat screen and we will address them toward the end of the program. I am Shirley Cadmus, the moderator, a retired art educator artist and gallery owner in Milton, North Carolina. For more information, go to shirleycadmus.com, miltonstudioartgallery.com, or the Facebook pages. I will first introduce the four panelists and then uh, speak to each one individually. The panelists, and if you would, uh, when I pronounce your name, you could wave or something so people know which one you are. Uh, Sid Thacker, originally from India, now living and working in Cary. He has been a computer scientist by profession, but tonight you will see him as an artist. Shante Stewart grew up in a military family and now calls Durham home. She holds degrees in political science and art education from North Carolina Central. She taught art for five years in the Durham Public Schools, now works for the North Carolina Department of Administration. Hendrika van der Kamp, originally from the Netherlands, now living in Durham. Um, she's a retired clinical psychologist, an academic researcher, and a writer, and creates her art form from found paper. Okay, um, Wei, Sun, Wei Sun, sorry. Originally from China, has lived in Raleigh since 1998. Software engineer by profession, is now additionally a potter with a studio in his home. Okay, we will start with Sid Thacker. Okay, do you still work? Um, as a computer scientist? Yes, I do. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this panel, International Focus and uh, Shirley. And uh, thanks for conducting this. Uh, we had a chat earlier and it's so nice to be here. I, I am I'm an active uh, computer scientist by profession and it's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could you briefly tell us what a computer scientist does? Oh, absolutely. I'd love to. So computers are ubiquitous. Uh, we can't live our and imagine our lives without them. But to make computers useful, we have to program them or write code. This ranges from writing simple apps to writing complex software to understand the weather, for example. And computer scientists work uh, patiently with numbers, especially ones and zeros, to try to figure out how best to take all the data in the world and convert them to something useful. So that's, in a nutshell, what computer scientists, programmers, coders do it every day. Thank you. Uh, what prompted you to pursue the art of paper cutting? Yes, in fact, it's, um, it was an accidental discovery when I was back in high school in India. I happened to come across uh, an article in a magazine about an artist in Jaipur in India who used to make uh, paper cuts uh, very much like these, uh, symmetric patterns out of paper cut with scissors and he used to do them for block printers and uh, fabric designers. And okay. after I saw those, uh, that article, I was really intrigued. And I picked up the first scissors and paper I could find <laughs> and uh, tried to replicate um, his artwork. And that started a lifelong journey with explorations by you know, just folding and cutting paper. And now more recently when I'm using uh, a craft knife uh, among other things. Okay, thank you. Uh, please show us some examples of your work. Oh, absolutely, I'd love to. So I was just showing you, these are simple patterns and let me do this, uh, turn off my virtual background for a second. 
Okay, so you should be able to see much better. So here are some paper cuts that have been cut from origami sheets. Origami paper are square pieces of paper that I cut using a craft scissors like these. Uh, again, these are not fancy. These are just very sharp and pointed scissors that I found on online. And after I fold and cut, some of these patterns come out like this. Very nice. And, very <laughs> Thank you. And so um, that kind of paper cutting I've been doing for a long time. But about in 2016, I decided to pick up this craft knife. It is a special type of knife because the blades are replaceable. I have a bunch of blades that I buy in bulk. This way. Maybe this way. So the blades break when I'm cutting paper by keeping it on a mat and I have to go to a number of blades when I'm uh, uh, making a paper cut. So typical examples of uh, making paper cuts using a knife come out like this. So this is on black card stock paper. I often draw and then use the knife to make this kind of artwork. I've tried to keep my symmetric work alive and often create artworks like these. So it may not appear, but uh, I have actually sandwiched the paper cut in between two glass sheets and mounted it in a box frame here. So really oh. interesting to see how the shadows interact with the artifact. And then finally, there are some pieces that are a little more intricate. And do you sign your work? I do. I When I mount them in frames with a uh, I often mount them in large frames with a white paper in the background. That's mm -hmm. what I find them. Uh, this one is obviously on a floating frame. As you can see, this is sandwiched between two glass sheets. Uh, the paper that I use is a special kind of paper called silhouette paper. It is matte black on one side and white on the other and lets me draw on it and cut it. Uh, what inspires you to work on in various designs? Where do you get your ideas from? Yes, so I often uh, pick up themes from Indian mythology, which is rich with a lot of stories, narratives, and, and characters uh, that has been um, uh, very inspiring to me personally. I'm also an avid reader of science fiction, so I, I make a lot of um, original ideas around science fiction topics and then transfer them onto paper and then cut them. It often the case that I'm trying to build um, ideas that are as different as possible from the previous paper cut I've done. So I try to explore motives and patterns here and there. And then of course there are the geometric shapes and patterns that I just showed you, which really are just an in interesting exploration in symmetry. Mm. And it can be organic shapes, they can be uh, geometric patterns and so on. Where can people go if they want to see and buy your work? So they can visit my website to see and learn more about paper cutting itself and my process. I'm very open, I'd like to share what I've learned through um, really experimentation. I'm not a trained artist, but I've discovered a few things as I've gone along cutting papers, exploring tools and, and different types of paper. So I have all of that on my website. You can go and check it out there. The links are here. Uh, I often exhibit uh, in various galleries. Um, haven't done that much, but I recently uh, participated in an uh, exhibition on Indian American visual artists that's going on in Tuscumbia in Alabama, which happens to be right next to Helen Keller's birthplace of all places. So that was very interesting. Oh. Yeah, and um, um, I have uh, material on my Instagram that I regularly update. Okay, and are you trying to uh, make a statement with your artwork? Are you uh, concerned with local issues, um, national issues and so forth? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, there are a few things that I do like to convey. First of all, and first and foremost, foremost is, I want to encourage everybody to be, to make art and to produce something using your hands. 
in this age of you know computers and apps and all the social media, you really forget that it's the most unique thing about humans is of course creating things by hand. We've been doing it for ages, and it doesn't take much to build and work with paper um, as such, and also paper cutting. Just just using simple instruments like these and origami paper, you can start creating something new. So that's that's the first thing I want to tell people. The second is. Um, I'm also trying to depict a lot of themes through my work, which um, address the topic of climate change and the, the various types of uh, issues that we are already beginning to face. And really for the young generation, I want to convey the fact that, you know, they are the ones who are going to have to bear the brunt. And so we have to really know what we need to save. So trying to convey themes on nature, preservation, and so on. Uh, would you tell us about a group that you organized um, as a community outreach? Yes, absolutely. So when I, when I started uh, working uh, with paper and started exhibiting my work, I was very curious about where are all the other artists. Obviously, Raleigh and the areas around here are very rich in um, art. But I was also seeking uh, artists in, within Indian community. Uh, also because the Indian culture type, tends to get typecast by you know, performance arts and food. Visual artists don't have a forum at par with other performance artists. So I decided to go out and meet other artists and create a community of Indian American visual artists. It's a group that we get together to check on each other, uh, connect through art and learn about each other's art journeys and also do social out, like outreach and workshops and so on. Uh, you can see the um, this way. You can see the uh, URL down here, civinc.org. A number of us participated in the art exhibition that is going on in Alabama. So through sharing of information, we are prospering together. Well, thank you very much. And we'll now uh, turn to Shante Stewart. Um, please give us a brief idea what your current uh, day job is, entails. You're, you're a, uh, a department of um, administration. Yes. administration. <laughs> yes, thank you for having me tonight. Yes, I um, work for the department of administration. I work under the hub department and I get female, uh, minority and disabled um, businesses certified for the state. Um, so they can be contractors for the state and get, and get more business for them. So. That's what I do now. Okay. And um, when did you, and why did you decide to uh, put more of your time into your artwork? Oh, I, um, I, well, I started, I guess, semi-professional. I, I don't, I wouldn't call myself too professional. <laughs> semi-professional. Um, when I, when I first bought my first, well, when I first did my apartment, and I was walking around like I could do this artwork, and um, so that's the professional when I first started. But my mother um, was an artist, and so I painted right along her. Um, when I was a little girl, so I would say my professional started when I was in kindergarten. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> There's a type of painting that you refer to as live painting. Mm -hmm. um, would you tell us about an important experience you had at a banquet? Oh, yes, I sure will. And I can also share a picture too if um, someone would um, disable the share screen. But uh, two years ago, when um, our vice president now, Kamala Harris, was on her campaign to be president, um, she stopped through Durham, uh, the Durham Committee on Affairs of um, Black People um, has a major event every year, a major banquet, and I started a painting and I finished a painting while um, people were watching and the numbers kept growing. First, there was a few people in the room and you know, you're know you into your painting and then you look up and I think there was like 800 people in attendance um, after. So that was an amazing experience. She also um, 
they also um, gave it to her. Um, and this is the experience that I'm talking about. Oh. So I got to meet her and yeah. And so they showed it to her, gave it to her, presented it and she clapped for me. So that was like so exciting right there that she clapped for me. Um, <laughs> so yeah. This Congratulations. Is the, That's your okay. major achievement. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I was nervous. So I was nervous. <laughs> Some of the portraits um, that I, I looked at that you did, I, I'm, they reminded me of uh, statues or yeah. us. Can you talk about those and yes, what sure you're can. trying to do? And... and I will show you a few of those pictures too that we're discussing. So these are three of the pictures um, that we discussed. Um, I started this series uh, during COVID, actually, when it was a vandalism of statues needing to come down in America, right? And I am a firm believer that if you do not have a solution to a problem, then you might, um, should not start the problem, right? So, and in my defense, I'm like, if I were to destroy or tear down statues, what would I put in this place? Um, and so my first painting is the Queen Khalifa. She was named after California. Um, and I thought this would be a, a perfect statue um, for me as a black woman in America. Um, so yeah, so this is the start of the series. Okay. Of my statues. And do you have more uh, have you picked out more figures to put into your series or? Um, this is, so I'm, I'm kind of stuck on three in series. So I've been um, <clears throat> doing three in a series. I've been thinking about more. I don't quite know what queen I, I want um, okay. next. I threw in the guy because, you know, I wanted to be equal opportunities. Um, so I, I got the King Tut in there and Queen Cleopatra, of course. So she completed okay. my series. All right. You are also known for your abstracts. Can you tell us about the multi-panel that uh, is in the background? And do you use the same type of paint when you're painting your abstracts as you did with the um, portraits? Um, somewhat. It's a mixed medium on uh, abstracts. I started off with abstract work. And, um, and so when I, I wanted a challenge, I got into more of the portraits. Um, abstract is really about the progress, the process, excuse me, the process of it. Um, you get to know yourself and the techniques that you need. You um, have to remember, you know, remember your techniques and what, what splatter does what design. And um, so, and sometimes you have to let go. Right, and, and, and realize that it might not be as perfect or your, your word of perfect um, that it is. Um, so yeah, I do spray paint um, and acrylic paint with my abstract. The one in the back of me um, is, is spray paint, um, acrylic paint, and gold leaf. So I play with some gold leaves. And I love abstracts with um, several panels. So I will do like three and four panels with my abstract work. So you can kind of create your own um, thing. You don't have to necessarily put it in this order. You can switch it around. Um, so I like to, for people with the abstracts to be creative um, in their own home. Okay, good. Um... What do you tell people who say they cannot draw? Ooh, I say all. <laughs> so I only had three rules in my art class uh, when I when I taught high school. And the first rule was all artists, our students are artists. Um, so I, I believe that everybody is an artist, whether you're an abstract artist, whether you are a portrait, um, crafts. Um, I believe that the world, <clears throat> could not be without art. Um, we could not get up and go to work without art. 
Um, somebody had to make our clothes. Somebody had to draw the bridge that we're drawing on, that we're driving on. And so, yeah, everybody's an artist. You just gotta pull it out of you. And you, you mentioned something when we were uh, discussing earlier. Um, people who think they can't draw, uh, and, I, and I, this, I believe this too, because I, I've taught art for many years. And the basic thing is to teach people what to, to see what they're looking at. Art is That's learning it. to see. That right. was a saying, yes. I, I kind of stole that saying from one of my professors at North Carolina Central. Um, but yes, art is learning to see, right? Um, to see it, and, and not figuratively either. Some, oh, figuratively and, and, um, and the you know, other way. Um, seeing mentally, right? Understanding yourself in your artwork and actually understanding detail. So both aspects of that. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for your discussion. And um, I think we're gonna move now to Hendrika Bendekamp. Um, would you like to say a few words about your, your work? Um, uh, you can find my really work, yes, at Strokes by SMS on IG. Um, I do have a website, um, Wix Strokes by SMS. Um, and yes, I'll be around term. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, Hendrika, uh, would you like to say a few words about your uh, former career in research and, and writing and so forth before we get into your artwork? Just a few words. Um, okay. I spent 25 years as an academic clinical psychologist training clinical psychologists, and then I did about 13 years of private practice. And at the moment, my academic day job is writing a book, uh, sort of a history biography of an unknown psychologist who deserves to be known. Good, good. All right. And uh, how far along are you in that book? I've been real interested to- I've got 3,000 pages and I'm not done. Okay. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Okay. Um, now you're into iris folding. And uh, would you explain the idea or inspiration behind uh, this work? Uh, what got you interested in it? Well, I found it absolutely by accident on the internet one day when I was looking for some rubber stamps. And I really wasn't good at rubber stamping. So I found something else that I turned out to be quite good at. So what do you want me to say about it? Yeah, well, the coincidence between, where did it begin? Oh, it began in the Netherlands. And yes, some Dutch ladies came up with this technique in order to recycle greeting card envelopes that were printed on the inside. And I gather that the Europeans have many more of those than we do. Most of my Hallmark cards have plain instincts. Okay. Um, I read in your bio that all patterns begin with a certain shape. And what shape is it? And is that what's referred to as the um, iris? Um, they all begin with a certain shape. So if you were... Um, okay, I want to be able to see what I'm doing here. Um, of the most basic is three sides. And if you have any geometry in your, in your brain, then you'll see that this pattern is created by fitting smaller triangles into a larger triangle. And that leaves an, a shape at the outside, right? So so you do this by starting with the one number, number one, and you lay a folded sheet of paper on this line and you work your way around, laying down pieces of paper and you'll see some pretty soon, um, until you get to the center. And the center is always gonna be the same shape as the outside, but it would lead to infinite regression if you kept on going. So at a certain point, you take this, iris at the center, 
and you put some fancy paper inside of it. So for example, um, let's see. This leaf has a triangle underneath it. And the iris is some sparkly gold. So it's laying the paper down from the outside in, and then in the end, putting in an iris. And you can do that with increasing numbers. So you can have four sides. So this pair, for example, is a four-sided figure. Or you could have five sides, like the teapot. And you could have six sides. And this is absolutely, this design is absolutely my own creation but that's a six-sided figure. Very nice. Inside a circle. And, and on this one, when I, was, when I first came up with the idea of the yin-yang sign, I tried it with a traditional iris and it just didn't look right. And so I put another yin-yang sign where the iris would be, which seemed to sort of fit the idea of what a yin-yang sign is all about. Okay, um, what, do, what do you enjoy as the creative part um, and your materials that you use? Do you have to order special materials? Do you have to pay lots of money for it or? It's entirely a recycling project. So when I first came across Iris Folding and these ladies, their book was full of all these fancy Hallmark envelope, I said, well, the only envelopes sitting around my house are insurance payment envelopes from the insurance companies that paid me to do therapy. And those were all black and white. So here is an example of simply using black and white envelopes to make a design. And you right. can see if you get a little closer, these are all security envelopes. Slightly and so where do you find your materials? Well, okay, so so just starting with their concept of envelopes, you can find them in green, you can find them in purple, you can find them in red. I had one Christmas I had fun taking these Salvation Army envelopes and making bells. And they come in blue. <laughs> um, isn't there a Just place? Just simply to recycling what comes in the mail. Right. But many, many other things. Uh, what, when you were talking earlier about art is learning to see in a new way, I see paper in a new way. So some of the things you'll find in my work, in my work after I realized you could do more than security envelopes, <laughs> I go to the scrap exchange and I buy, you know, old crane stationery. Um, when you get a Christmas card and the envelope flap is silver or gold, that's supply. Candy wrappers. Um, my primary sources of silver and silver are tea bag wrappers. You get shiny silver and you get matte silver, right, from your tea bags. Um, At, at, um, at the last Christmas party, I picked up some of those crowns. I have a whole supply of, and each year they're a different texture. I've got three or four years worth of Christmas crowns. Um, the, um, the yin yang sign, which winds up being very, very, you know, there's very many pieces of paper. For the white, I use the protective sheet that you find in those old photo albums. Very, very thin paper that you put between the pages. And the black is a similar sheet from a photo album. So it's fairly thin, you want very thin paper. Um, so it's, it's almost, you know, an, another thing, um, envelopes. So here's, a, here's an envelope that had this printed on the outside, but it's this very iridescent paper 
Mm -hmm. The latest green one I found at the scrap exchange, lovely iridescent green, silver. And I find them at the scrap exchange. I don't pay stationers yeah. prices. Um, the old crane and what's an Eaton stationery, they'll have the lined envelopes. So I have shiny and unshiny blues. Oh, here's another silver one, I guess. Um, those are just some examples. It's sort of, you start seeing potential everywhere. I can show you another one. The old, the old boxes of stationary cranes, Eaton's. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, one example of using these is a collection of bow ties. Oh, what about the dancing dress? Um, I can show you a couple of dancing dresses. Let's see. And what was your inspiration well, for? Dancing? Well, oh, the dancing dress. Yeah. Um, this and this, and there is a third one. I don't know if you remember, there was a women's heart health campaign that had these red dresses. They even made them into pins. So I took those and made patterns out of them. And this particular one uses origami paper in the skirt. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, and then I use a little cutting thing and use some of that silver paper from an envelope liner for the belt. Um, and this is another, this is the one I really like is the dancing dress, right? But it's the same. Okay, I want to say that um, you usually on the back of your work, you write what pieces, what kind of papers you use and all. And right. I found that even if there are like uh, several women looking at the same pattern, like it could be a dress or whatever, they read about the papers and, oh, I want that one because it's got a candy kiss wrapper or whatever in it. And it means something to them from their past. So they're attracted to a certain papers that you use too, as well as colors and so forth. Oh yeah, the, be the best example of that was at Christmas time when I had a friend and I, a friend who was a potter and I did a garage sale artwork and I had made a dancing dress using the end papers from the um, Sabine and Griffin books. Do you know those? Those, it's a book. It's a book of letters from these two people to each other, and the mm. end papers were gorgeous. And a woman looked at that, and she bought it as a gift for her husband because that was a book they read together. Okay. One last question. Okay. Uh, you were commissioned to do a specific pattern. Uh, relating to COVID. Can you show us an example of that and how you had to come up with the pattern yourself? Yeah. I was commissioned actually to make a COVID mask, a framed piece, and I'll show you one, um, as a graduation gift for someone who was graduating from um, like a um, physician assistant program. So I had to think about it and I finally decided I would use this shape of the mask. And then I use underneath it, the five point, actually the pattern I used was like this large, this large oval. I just fit it on that. Mm -hmm. um, and then she got, she got a framed one. Mm -hmm. And this one, one of your questions that you had written down, Shirley, is how does the work start? And this is one where it started with the frame. I simply fell in love with the frame. That, that sort of celadon green with silver right, streaks. Right. So I brought it home and thought, you know, sooner or later the right papers will show up for it. And then, <laughs> and then this one, a traditional iris didn't work either. So I don't know if you can tell, but there's a coronavirus. You can print where those out. Coronavirus from the, the CDC website. And okay. you can print them like 50 to a sheet or whatever. You set the size. And so I just printed them on glossy paper and then I cut them with a, with a cutter. Okay, Hendrika, um, we're going to have to move on. But where can people go to find examples of your work, like to purchase or? Um, right now, you just have to go to Iris Folding Crafts on Facebook. And if you want to buy a piece, you just have to contact me. I haven't had any luck selling them online. You know, they sell at galleries, but they don't sell when people just- Well, what about in Milton? In Milton, I said at galleries, right? 
the, <laughs> yes, the Milton Gallery and Sissy's Gallery yeah. in Durham has some cards. Okay, thank you. And now we are up to Wei Sun. Um, can you tell us briefly what you do as a software engineer? Oh, sure. Uh, so first, um, Thanks for um, for uh, for uh, the uh, International Council to uh, Art Council have me here tonight. Uh, yeah, I have been um, doing software engineering for uh, let me think 20, 24 years. So uh, that this is my uh, uh, daytime job. I would say I'm a software engineer by day, and I'm potter uh, 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 potter by night and weekends. So, um, so you will probably ask me what uh, kind of software engineer I do. Uh, for uh, almost uh, 20 years, I, uh, I was doing the uh, network communication, especially on the voice. So our company developed lots of the uh, IP phones. You probably see it in, in the stores and also the uh, uh, web uh, meeting um, like uh, WebEx, like the Zoom we're using is actually developed by us. So that's what I do. Um, but uh, yeah, recently I switched to do uh, software engineering specializing cyber cyber security. So anytime you go online, um, likely you're using our uh, 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 protection software behind the scene to make sure your traffic's safe. That's what I do during the day. Thank you. And and what in the world inspired you to pursue a, the second career uh, as a plotter? You yes. say you took a trip. Yes. So uh, this is also about five, maybe 10, 15 years, around 15 years ago. I was uh, uh, look, just had free time. I was looking for something to do. And something I can feel uh, myself in and also feel myself connected to the world through a me media. So I was, I was trying a few things like uh, drawing and painting and just thought, uh, that, uh, uh, did not speak to me. But one day a friend of mine took me to a trip to uh, a town called, a pottery town called Seagrove in uh, not too far from Raleigh, but an hour from Raleigh. And it's a very traditional uh, 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 like uh, pottery town. They have, I would, uh, I would say 150 potters in this one little town. So we, we made a day trip and I can see, uh, I could see all the people's work, their studio, their kiln. And I was just amazed to, uh, to see that you can create all those beautiful things right like there. So then I would, saying like, let me try uh, just take a class in a local community center, uh, just say if I like it or not. So that this is about 12 years ago. So I took my first class right in my doorstep in, a, uh, uh, in Raleigh Pulling Art Center. So that's the first class I took. And then I just continued um, to taking more classes uh, in um, Pulling Art Center and then NC, uh, NC State Craft Center, those are great learning centers, and then just start from there and then just keep growing until I have a second career here. <laughs> and you studied with a, a well-known potter for a time, didn't you? Right, so this, this so we, we, I started with a, a, a like community art center for probably first five years. And then I did, uh, uh, so then um, I just tried to, to get a more professional training so I took few classes and also winter, uh, winter residency uh, each time the two to four weeks at uh, a, a, a special uh, like art school. It's a very, very good art school in um, Penland, North Car Carolina. It's called the Penland School of Crafts. So uh, I just took different uh, classes from very uh, like, uh, famous award known uh, uh, artist potter uh, in Penland for a few years. And then in 2019, then I, that was the time I decided I do want to take a break from, from work and just study the pottery, like from like in a, you know, more like you know, from beginning to end and then try to do uh, learn all the process and all the, all the stages. So I took a break from work about 10 months and I uh, became an apprentice under a 
very uh, good partner in Raleigh. Uh, her name is Marsha Owen. So I'm very thankful for Marsha to spend all this time with me. For, and then uh, um, after that, we still continue to work together and on uh, on few like a very big project. So so we still keep uh, I still uh, keep very good um, relation a close relation with her right now. Great. Can you show us some of your work and maybe more of your studio? Oh yeah, sure. I'd love to. So my work is, um, I would say, try to be. Uh, uh, it's more like na uh, nature-inspired uh, functional piece. I, I, my, uh, my go, my goal is to put a piece of art on people's house so people can work, uh, can use them a piece of art, but it's uh, completely functional. So um, this is something I created. Um, I call it a bamboo stand. A bamboo cup, so it's a three section, um, and then with uh, with gold gold slip and bamboo uh, brushwork, uh, bamboo leaves. Even the handle has like knobs here. The, the mimic the whole thing is mimic a bamboo. So something uh, I created, and then something like um, a picture. See, this is very quiet picture, but. Um, um, has uh, again brushworks. I do like uh, a lot of a lot of brushworks in my work. Um, something like um, a plate. So uh, instead of a, a, a typical round plate, this is has uh, cut into sides like this. So um, I just want to create art that people can can use, and something like a teacup, like this teacup. Mm. Very, uh, so uh, people always ask me, where do you get the ideas of, um, of the uh, brushwork? My mom is an artist as well, so she does a lot of painting. Mm -hmm. So just by watching her uh, since I was a kid, and then this is some of her work, you can see the influence on me. So oh, that's yeah. The, yeah, this is the uh, um, orchid flower she paints, and then this is my cup. Mm -hmm. And then something like, yeah, like the uh, bamboo style I was showing. So this is her bamboo painting. And the leaf is, is exactly on this here. So um, yeah, I do. And for my work, I like to play with different shape and just uh, see if I can uh, uh, start with uh, uh, something on a wheel, but then I alter it into, into a different shape. and. Uh, also make, make it, it functional. An example is this planter. So I made it on a wheel and then I completely changed the shape. And then it's actually two piece. There's a, um, um, things on here, it's, it's double wall. So an orchid will be perfectly fit in here. And then when, when you water it, and then the uh, water actually goes down here. So, it's, so, 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 so that, uh, that will keep an orchid get wet. So something like this, I like to uh, design or create a shape I like, and also make it um, a functional piece. And also itself, it's a piece of art people can enjoy at, at the house. Um, I, I'm very drawn to the, um, the bamboo. Yeah, stomp. this is bamboo style. This is where, a, where would a person go to, to buy one or? Yeah, so um, uh, to get information, you can always uh, go to my website, waysoundpottery.com. Uh, there's, a, there's a shop link and over there you can find uh, the uh, the galleries and shops uh, who sells my work. Uh, so in Raleigh, um, it's uh, I have work mostly. I have work in Cedar Creek Gallery. They just mm -hmm. had a they just had a big uh, batch. Um, they just purchased a big batch of my work yesterday. So like bamboo styles, this bamboo work, uh, bamboo picture, and some of the bowls like soup bowls like this and the plate like this. Uh, you will see that in uh, uh, Cedar Creek uh, this weekend, uh, start this weekend. Mm. And we also purchased some birdhouse, like something like this. So they have six birdhouse over there. <laughs> uh, yeah, so C Cedar Creek is one. And also Penland School Gallery uh, has my work online. 
as well. And there's also a small shop, a, a very boutique, a nice boutique shop in Wilson called uh, the uh, Selkies. Uh, these are the three main shop, uh, retail shops to sell my work. And also there are other, uh, other places um, uh, also sells my work, but uh, not as uh, 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 you won't probably, they won't have uh, as good inven inventory as uh, Cedar Creek and Penland Gallery. Like in Raleigh, there's a uh, NOFO, um, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, the o Auckland Museum will sell my work as well. Um, there, there's Charlie Cumming um, uh, Gallery in Florida who carries my uh, work and also the uh, uh, Green Hill in um, Greensboro also carry my oh, work. Wow. Yeah. And uh, oh. once, twi I think twice a year, a spring and, and, and uh, and the and the uh, uh, near holidays, I will, usually I will do online sale. I don't do that very often, but I do uh, once or twice a year. I open an online store also uh, at my uh, website with some pottery. Uh, online store will open, and uh, uh, I do a few local art shows like um, boiling art, art walk. You will find me over there um, almost every year. What was your um, your big project, their most ambitious project <laughs> so far? Yes, so this is a, there's a project. Uh, Marsha Owen, my uh, mentor and teacher, and now is a very good friend, close friend. Marsha and I decided to um, to take a job um, uh, to make uh, the auction mark for Penland School of Crafts. So Penland School, they do a, a huge auction. They, norm, they usually will auction one to two million dollars. Art arts donated by um, like two or three hundred pieces of arts donated by all the, uh, all the uh, artists. In, so they will have this big auction in August. For the people go there, they will um, purchase ticket and then they can go there, but they, uh, everyone can get a, a mug. So Penland has doing this for at least 20, maybe 30 years. So we, they call that Penland auction marks. So Marcia and I did, did this, uh, this, this project, like this project. We spent almost a, uh, on and off a year in uh, last year, 2022, uh, sorry, 2021. We designed, we test, uh, tested, and we, 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 we uh, uh, test twice uh, firing the marks in Penland school. And uh, finally, in, uh, uh, we spent two months and we made 500 to 550 marks and fired in Poland this in February. Some of this, the, these are the Poland School of Marks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, we have a few style. This is um, my, I have my uh, um, brushwork on there as well. So you will see the Poland School and year and also at the bottom, it's something very special. So Penland School is started by a, a woman. Her name is Lucy Morgan. So Lucy started Penland School uh, as a weaving uh, workshop to help uh, the local mountain women. You know, uh, the, she taught them how to weave and she will sell the fabric to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the shops and other places. And then so these mountain women can have some extra income. So this is the start of Penland as a weaving cabin, weaving workshop. This is about a uh, more than hundred years ago. So, uh, so uh, one of the, one of the uh, weaving pattern we found in the Pillen archive is done by Lucy Morgan, and this is the pattern. So we screen, uh, we screen printed, it and we, uh, and then we uh, uh, screen print, uh, we uh, 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 screen printed every uh, pattern onto the mug. So five hundred fifty marks, each one will have the same Lucy Morgan weaving pattern. So this is it. This is a big project. We have a couple minutes left, but. Uh, okay. How do you sign your work a certain way on the bottom? Yes, uh, all my work has a, has my stamp. I don't know if you can see that. It's a okay. W. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and your brush work reminds me of bamboo leaves. Yes, that's, yeah. mm -hmm. that's uh, exactly, it's, uh, that's the uh, intention, yeah. Okay, let's see if we have any questions to address. 
Yes, hello. We have a lot of questions. And first oh, okay. Oh, wow. Good. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Ade. I'm an intern for International Focus. And I just want to say thank you to the United Art Studio for hosting all of this and all of our amazing artists that we had today share their work. Big thank you from International Focus. And I know that our participants love your work. I learned so much and I'm just blown away by all of your talents. And personally, I'm not an artist. I'm an athlete. I I am a senior at Duke University right now. Um, yeah, can't, well, like you guys said, everyone's an artist, but um, still still trying to find my calling. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> we have a few questions in the chat and I'm just gonna direct them to each one of you. And if each one of you can just say a little spiel about um, how this affects you and so we can get through it. Um, so a lot of, a lot of the artists on this panel, you guys are from different countries or um, you're from here right in North Carolina, but you've all came to North Carolina to share your artwork. So through your ideas and through your artwork, how have you used that to um, strengthen your relationship, not only with the local community, but communities back at home as well? I'll go first. Um, during COVID, it, I started my first mural um, downtown. Um, when all the buildings got boarded up. And so I was a part of the Black Lives Matter um, art movement downtown um, when it first started. And I think that um, kind of started my mural side of my artwork. Um, and, and I was just donating my time. Um, that was my um, give back to um, the community and it was well received, so. Yeah, I can do it. Um, thanks for doing this again. So one of the ways that I'm hoping to make a little difference is through participating in um, there are charity events where I'm donating my work, which funds education for girls back in India. That's that's one way I'm hoping to make a, a difference. Locally, I go around the public library system. I try to share my work. I've discovered it, like I said, accidentally, and I want to share it share it with others and encourage others to make art. Thanks. Great. Hendrika? Boy, I can't say I'm doing anything at that level. What I try to do is make my cards gifts to people. Mm. Like I spent this last weekend at a grief retreat because one of my sisters died recently and, and I sent cards afterwards to all the participants with a note, you know, and, and when there's somebody sick at church, I'll send them a card. Um, so it's it's a more personal thing rather than a political or social kind of kind of thing. Thank you. Way. Yeah. So I was trying to help help people um, just to uh, that when people are just stuck at home and they have not uh, just try to do something. So I was uh, uh, partnered with Pullen Art Center. I did some online. Uh, demos on the clay and then just and also uh, on the uh, one of the Christmas I think two years uh, when the pan pandemic first hit so I did a uh, Christmas like uh, on it making uh, ornaments making with the neighborhood kids so hopefully that will keep them give them something to do and uh, and they also introduce art in at the uh, early ages to the to the uh, to the kids, and uh, let's try to to bring art into people's work, and then maybe uh, that will change uh, just a little bit. That will help their life gets better. Thank you, guys. Um, another question that we have: We know that uh, Shantae and Wei, you guys have your family influences your art a lot. Um, or you have artists in your family. Um, if the other artists can speak on that, how your family influences your art or how other artists in your family influence the products that you make today. Yeah, for me, it's, I, I've seen my, uh, my mom's painting for the last several decades. And then uh, I don't think I specifically try to copy her. You just see her doing that uh, uh, almost every day, and just naturally for me, it's like it's like her uh, her influence is just deep inside my mind. I didn't even realize I was actually repeat what she's doing 
and you can um, like this I showed you earlier. So I didn't even realize I was actually repeating her. I did not studying uh, Chinese painting or whatever. I think just saying this is uh, the influence is always carries uh, just that that's why I was trying to uh, introduce some of the art kits. Now, who knows what in a few years or what, or the, uh, what they were thinking, or maybe they'll remember this. So just put a little bit seed in their, in their mind. And hopefully when they will grow, just like my uh, parents are did to me. My family didn't have any artists. Mm -hmm. And so it's been, it's been so fun to be in my retirement and to discover that I'm an artist. But one thing I do do, the Dutch influence, um, we, we love Delft blue. So I try sometimes to work, you know, that's got, it turned out the wrong way, but my fish, I think of it as a Delft kind of fish. So it's sort of a Dutch and family thing, but you know, my family, they're all the very practical, down to earth business kinds of folks. So, but they, when I, when I posted on my Facebook page today that I was doing this, I got a lot of affirmation for it. Go for it. You know, we're so proud of you. We love your art. So that's neat. But no artists really in my family. One of my nieces is really starting to do furniture refinishing and she's good, quite artistic. And in my family, yes, my mom was an artist, and I still bounce ideas off of her. I like take pictures, like, what do you think of this, mom? And she really, um, she gives it to me, and I need that um, advice because you know people who aren't artists sometimes just kind of say, oh, that looks nice. And as artists, when you're looking for feedback, you want that criticism, and she definitely gives it to me. Um, I have aunts that are artists. Um, I do come from a, a big family of, of art. Fantastic. In my case, my dad used to paint occasionally. My aunt was a, an MFA, so I grew up watching that. But really, uh, right now, my kids, I learned a lot from them. And sometimes I try to replicate. So this is these are some paper cuts that I made. Oops, I think I need to turn off my uh, view here. So you can actually see these. So they, they make these caricatures and I try and um, replicate some of them by cutting them on a piece of paper. Oh. So really, I mean, I would be happy if I can make such expressive characters like these kids do that. So they're, they're mm. a huge inspiration for me. Sweet. Those are great. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And just one last question to wrap this, um, this up. You guys all or um, most of you all have day jobs. And that's amazing that you get that everyone can juggle their day job and their artistic um, ventures. So how do you create time to make your art and um, really push it forward? For me, it's just nice relaxation after I've been writing all day. And during the pandemic, when we couldn't go to church, I would listen to WCPE and the sacred music, and I would just create on Sunday mornings. So it's, you know, I, I don't, mine isn't a job. This is retirement, keeping myself busy. So if I want to take a day just to play with my art, I can. Yeah, and um, for me, I think my ad advice is if you want to do something, do something you, you like to do. So like, if you really love art or even your, uh, anything you like, uh, your, your job, when you like to do the job, really, you will find time to, for, for this. I like both my job, my daytime job as engineer and the, uh, as a, uh, and the potter. And so... I don't mind the work over time or like you would say over time. It's like literally I have two full-time jobs. So I probably work at least 70, 80 hours every week. I, I love it. 
so so um and but but i i i, I talked uh, like a lot of my friends asked me this question how do you balance this this two right so um, for me, it's uh, I did not plan this, but these two jobs they actually complement each other very well. It's almost I use two part of my brain. If I really get tired, uh, like writing program computer or whatever, I come down um, use my wheel to throw it apart. Um, mm -hmm. It's not working. It's 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 almost relaxing uh, relaxing and vice versa pottery is very uh, demanding like i said i uh, we, after two months of making that 550 marks i was physically exhausted mm -hmm. and then when i but then uh, when this project is ended i just sit in front of my, of my computer try to do my daytime job that feels like <laughs> Application. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm just saying that yeah, find the good balance and then the mm -hmm. time just 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 yeah, you if you like to do uh, something, you will find the time. Yeah, likewise, um, it's just finding time when the VRs when everybody's asleep or because I can work iteratively uh, with paper cutting. I always usually work over a period of time. That's a very common question I get asked, like how many hours did it take? Cumulatively a lot, but you know, working here and there. So yeah, yeah I reflect what Mason just said. Yeah, and also it's always in, uh, uh, very, very helpful if you have your a, a daytime work, your management and coworker or support you. That's really helpful. Yeah, mm -hmm. I get really good, great uh, management. They understand that a lot of times I need to take time um, off from work. So like if I go to Poland, fire a kiln, I need a week or two. My other teammate will take my take help me my uh, uh, my uh, my uh, work, and so I can focus on the other one. And uh, I will return the favor to them later. But you know, to have a good team work together, support each other is very important. And I would uh, have to say, family and friends is too. Like the, I won't come this far if I don't have my partner support or my family support me. And yeah. I think we're out of time. And I want to thank all of you so much. I really enjoyed getting to know you and what kind of work you do. And many thanks to uh, International Focus for sponsoring this activity. Um, so yeah, I would say thanks for the uh, for for uh, international focus as well, and uh, Sherry for hosting this talk, and all the audience join this show. Um, if anybody uh, want um, ask me any questions, just feel free uh, re reach me email Instagram. I'll be available. Oh, and for people who couldn't make it tonight, there will be a recording of the video on YouTube at some point. That's good. Hey, thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Thank you guys right. for having us. Fun Bye. to share the evening with you. Uh,